So after sociobiology, Edward Wilson had another trick up his sleeve, and that trick was the book Genes, Mind and Culture. We can think of sociobiology as being divided into two different phases. In the first phase that was represented by Wilson's book Sociobiology, we see a genes to behaviour model. In phase two, we see a genes to mind to behaviour model. And in the first model, there'd be no consideration paid to the impact of evolution on the brain or the mind. But in the second model, the mind was going to be brought in as something that was evolved, and that was going to explain why humans behave in the way that they behave. And we can see this in the quote that I've got up here. For mankind, at least, these postulates of radically incorrect behaviour is not explicit in the genes, and mind cannot be treated as a mere replica of behavioural traits. We propose a very different view in which genes prescribe a set of biological processes, which we call epigenetic rules, that direct the assembly of the mind. Culture is the translation of the epigenetic rules into mass patterns of mental activity and behaviour. Genes are indeed linked to culture, but in a deep and subtle manner. So in fact, what Sociobiology 2 was doing was basically building the mind in and saying that human culture, the way that we behave, the things that we create, how we associate with each other, the fact that we're all here sitting together in a lecture theatre can all be explained by that translation from genes to mind to mass behaviour. It's actually a very reductionist claim and it chains the mind to our evolutionary inheritance. And Wilson laid down the epigenetic rules, the neural pathways and regularities in cognitive development by which the individual mind assembles itself. And then individual minds working together, having been assembled from this evolutionary inheritance, produce culture. Now, of course, there had always been strong links built between the evolution of culture. Darwin had done it. And we can see these psychological, ecological milestones as we look across history, as we look from Darwin onwards. We see in Origin of Species, Darwin talking about, in the distant future, I see open fields for far more important researchers. Psychology will be based on a new foundation, that of the necessary acquirement of each mental power and capacity by gradation. So he's suggesting that his own evolutionary theory, evolution through natural selection, is going to have an impact upon psychology, the understanding of how the human mind functions. And of course, just to remind you, the Freudian mind, as it emerged in Freud's theory from the 1890s onwards, was, in effect, a Darwinian biological model of psychology. In retrospect, with the discrediting of Freudianism and the downgrading of psychoanalysis as a tool for curing people with mental illness, we tend to forget that Freud's theories were actually deeply biological. He believed that the structure of the mind, the nature of consciousness, and its relationship to the subconscious were all the product of our evolutionary inheritance. So here he is, Freud, the founder of a psychoanalysis. What was it he said about cigars? Sometimes cigars are just cigars. I'm not sure if he said that or someone that was criticizing him said it, but there he is, cigar in hand. And he believed that the mind consisted of three separate parts, all of which had evolved. There was the id, the animal drives, that connection with animals that Darwin suggested so strongly. There was the ego that represented our reasoning, our rational elements, the most evolved part of the mind. And there was the superego that negotiated between the animal drives and the reason, rationality, was in effect the conscience. And it's a model that was underpinned by Darwinian evolution. We also see it in the works of the incredible William Jane, one of the great figures of the 19th and early 20th century, a polymath, a physiologist, a psychologist, a man of letters. The man that came up with the term that I'm sure you're all aware of, 
stream of consciousness. He was one of the first people to construct consciousness as being this kind of flow of thoughts, connected and unconnected. He was, of course, the brother of the celebrated Henry James, and in some respects, outside of literature, had a much larger impact upon the world than his more celebrated brother. He was a philosopher as well, as you can see from the quote that's up there. But we have to understand that the principles of psychology that he laid down were fundamentally Darwinian. So once again, we can see the impact of evolution upon models of the mind. But these only really just touched on the fact that the human species had come from other species that were connected to animals, that were connected to apes, that were ultimately connected to single cell life forms. The connections that Darwin made, for example, when he compared what he thought a dog looking happy was with a human looking happy and saying, oh look, we can both see that when they're happy they smile or they do similar things with their faces. For Darwin, that was a direct acknowledgement of common descent, that somewhere back we shared common descent with dogs and had retained that particular trait. What we're going to see in the 1960s as we lead towards sociobiology and evolutionary biology are deeper causal connections between animal behaviour and human behaviour that go way beyond the notions of common descent. We can see the origins of evolutionary psychology lying not just in the realms of sociobiology, but in the discipline from which sociobiology emerged, which was ethology, which is basically the study of animal behaviour. And two particularly important ethologists we can see here, Lorenz and Tinbergen, who were joint Nobel Prize winners for studying the individual and social behaviour in birds. And it wasn't long before ethologists started drawing connections between the behaviour of insects or the behaviour of birds and the behaviour of human beings. Perhaps the most popular example of this was Desmond Morris, who wrote and published The Naked Ape, that became an even bigger bestseller than sociobiology, that argued very strongly for the fact that we could understand human behaviour if we understood humans as being essentially primates and of course as we've seen sociobiology. But evolutionary psychology came of age, if that is really the right word, when The Adapted Mind was published in 1992. And this was where things took off and it was also where things began to get really nasty because I'm not going to even begin to try and defend some of the things that a number of evolutionary psychologists have said. I'm just going to put it out there for you to make your own assessment. So what are the basics of evolutionary psychology? How does it work? Let's take the work of the respected Edward H. Hagen here on a field trip. I haven't been able to identify which one of the fellas he is in that group. Maybe the one with the red beard. I, I do hope so. Or maybe he's the slightly elder man. Evolutionary psychologists are betting that cognitive structure, like physiological structure, has been designed by natural selection to serve survival and reproduction. Humans have regularly encountered automobiles, encounters that also can seriously impede reproduction, e.g. by getting run over. Because 200,000 years is long enough for humans to evolve protective mechanisms, but 100 years isn't, we can predict that humans may well possess an innate aversion to spiders and snakes, but not to automobiles, even though far more people are currently killed by cars than by spiders or snakes. The adaptive mind cannot cope with automobiles. It hasn't had time to cope with cars. If we take evolutionary time, that is between 1,000 and 10,000 generations, whereas for humans one generation is 20 years. Major evolution occurred between 20 times 100,000 and 20 times 1,000, which is 200,000 to 20,000 years ago or thereabouts, in other words, the Pleistocene era. Our brain, our mind, because they collapsed the two into each other, evolved during this period as a result of selective adaptation. So, we're afraid of snakes, we can deal with snakes and spiders, we can judge their danger, 
but not cars, because we haven't had time to adapt to them. I don't know how well this stands up really as a theory. I think that we probably need to look at other areas of psychology. People like going fast. We've always liked going fast, as fast as we can. <laughs> this is actually nothing less than what has been called the Savannah Principle. The principle that states that we are the products of that moment when we came down from the trees, started living in society on a savanna plain in Africa before coming out of Africa. And the notion is that we are still living with the mind that was evolved at that particular point. As we'll see, the phrase Stone Age minds in modern bodies crops up quite a lot. We see this kind of idea in the notion of the triune brain, which was developed by Paul D. McLean, physician and neuroscientist, who believed that the brain, if you look at it, you know, you look at its structure, follow it up from the medulla oblongata right the way through the cerebellum to the brain's cortexes, was actually a recapitulation of the evolutionary process, of our evolution. So we have within us a reptile brain, the earliest to evolve. We have a mammalian brain which connects us with dogs and with apes. And then we have the human neo-mammalian brain with the neocortex being the bit that concerns the evolutionary psychologist. And with these kind of models, you are now equipped to explain pretty much everything, just as with sociobiology. All of these factors can be explained by that evolutionary inheritance, particularly our relationship with each other within these particular configurations. It is perhaps worth looking at some highly controversial moments to really focus upon the way that evolutionary psychology sidetracks itself by trying to explain the unacceptable. For example, rape and pillage. Not the rape and pillage conducted by the barbarians on the Roman Empire. Not the pillage of Attila the Hun, nor that of the highly civilised Vikings. No, this was much worse. We have a look at the unfortunately named Randy Thornhill, or the less esoterically named Craig Palmer, who went on to argue that rape and adaptation were closely connected to each other, and that there was a genetic advantage to rape as a practice, that somehow rape was natural. Victims' partners are not suspicious of their claims of rape if they show injuries which prove a struggle. Injuries demonstrate less of a threat to the male partner's paternity of offspring because it shows resistance to the rape, therefore making it less likely that it was consensual and therefore lessens the likelihood of the male abandoning the victim. A natural biological phenomenon that is a product of the human evolutionary heritage akin to the leopard spots and the giraffe's elongated neck. That's rape, by the way. So that's us all told. That's the feminists told. Get on with it. Don't complain about it. Because, hey, it's only natural. And unless we think that this is just an aberration, we only have to look at the work of individuals like Kanazawa, who is based at the London School of Economics. That's not like being based at the University of Trompton or something like that. That is actually being based at one of the most powerful and prestigious institutions in the Western world. They employ him. And he's quite capable of arguing, as we see here, in a piece that he published in Psychology Today, that based upon the Savannah Principle, <laughs> black women were less attractive than other women, and that the most attractive women were, were Caucasian. He's Japanese, by the way. And he believed that there was an evolutionary explanation for this revival revolving around adaptation. He also had earlier argued that smart people drink more based upon the Savannah Principle. I mean, it was an extraordinarily counterintuitive thing to argue, but basically he argued that smart people had adapted to the risks better than non-smart people and therefore understood the risks of drinking more and therefore were more intelligent. And it was an extraordinary argument to come up with. And of course, you can go and have a look at it out there. There are still vestiges, although psychology today has done their best to remove
viewed the experiment that he conducted upon race. And it has to be said, well, you know, LSE said, you're not to publish in anything other than peer-reviewed journals, but just get on with doing what you're doing. That's okay, as long as you don't cause embarrassment. But, and you can go and see his blog, this came very strongly out of his background as someone that believes fundamentally in evolutionary psychology. I think that we have to have a look at some of the dissidents, some of the dissidents to both evolutionary psychology and to the wider sphere of both sociobiology and neo-Darwinism. The kind of people that have resisted the claims that I've detailed, people like Stephen Jay Gould, who believe that these kind of things are false science because it isn't falsifiable, these kind of hypotheses. You cannot design an experiment to falsify them. What tends to happen is that people like Kanazawa start out with a supposition and then use their evolutionary theory to prove the supposition with extremely limited evidence. And we've already seen that Gould and people allied with him tend to come from the left. But it's not just Gould that doesn't like this kind of stuff. There's a lot of people in the world of evolutionary biology who find it unscientific, deeply distasteful and generally derogatory to the entire project of science. And typical of that would be the blogger and biologist P.Z. Myers, who's very famous within secularist circles. And of course, philosophers tend to think that this is all a load of complete and utter rubbish. But hey, that's the thing. It's bound to get column inches and centimetres, if you want to talk centimetres. I tagged on at the end of this section something about Richard Dawkins' ideas of memes, because to some degree these are actually tied quite closely to notions around evolutionary psychology. So memes, memes, what are they? What do you think of a meme? The word seems to have transformed in the last couple of years into something that I don't think Richard Dawkins meant it to be. He believed that the meme was almost like a unit of culture that was produced and reproduced in the brain. And as a unit, it would spread, but it would only spread according to the laws of natural selection. So if it was a bad meme, the meme would get selected out. And it's a, a view you can see in a number of his works, including The God Delusion, where he talks about memes. What do I think about memes? I mean, I'll raise my objections about, because I'm a materialist, but I don't believe that biology is everything, but other people might have a another opinion or a stronger opinion or for my mind it's where does the biology begin and the culture end and the culture begin and the biology end because I think one of the problems I have with the kind of mimetic if you want to call it or Dawkins view is it doesn't have that looping effect the fact that biology and culture mutually constituted would be the wrong word but they're certainly involved in some form of dialectical process where the two shape each other and you can't determine everything biologically or determine everything culturally but see the two actually involved in this kind of circular process of reinforcement. I think this points towards the real problems and the real controversies that emerge out of Darwinism. We've seen them emerging time and time again. What is the relationship between society and culture and our evolutionary inheritance? What does it mean to have come out of primates? What does that imply for the way that we behave and the kind of things that we do? And I don't think that we've got to a point where we've really even begun to figure out the complex interaction between mind and culture and between mind and evolution. Um, my suspicion is that um, mind itself goes beyond evolution than we could possibly imagine. That we can't just pin everything down to our evolutionary inheritance. My other criticism against theories about memes is that we've actually come up with some pretty good explanations of social behaviour, social development, cultural development, um, that do a pretty good job at explaining a whole range of phenomena, in fact a, a lot of phenomena within the human and material world. Theories that have come out of politics and philosophy and sociology that really don't need to fall back upon biology as being the 
first stop. And in this instance, what seems to be happening is that biology becomes, instead of God, the first great cause. Or should we be starting for the first, looking for the first moving cause? Or should we be really analysing what's actually going on on the ground? Which is why I don't like the work of those people that I've listed there, Carol and Runciman, because I think in both those cases, they fail to develop a theory that helps us understand either literature or social and economic development that really speaks to anything other than the fact that we know that evolution has occurred.